You're watching Circuit Analysis. I'm Jesse, and today we're going to be working on designing some power electronics. So this project is a power supply to test other power supplies. So it's going to have a USB connection so you can control it from a computer, write test scripts, and then have a variable output voltage to power the other power supplies. So in this video, we're going to go over an overview of the design specifications and then the sub circuits that make up the power supply and then look at the first uh, circuit we're going to design the boost stage and then do a summary of future videos and topics for this project so here is the data sheet this is a pretty lame data sheet but the main idea is we want to plug it into a wall socket so 120 to 240 volts uh, 240 is not really necessary, but we might as well make it universal. We'll see if we run into any issues with that. The output voltage is going to be in the 0 to 150 volts DC range, adjustable. The output current uh, in the 0 to 3 amp range, and the output power around 100 watts. So this is going to be for small DC to DC converters in the 5, 15, 20, 30 watt kind of range. So one of the reasons for doing this custom and not just using an off-the-shelf power supply is because of this transient response requirement. So when you're testing DC-DC converters, you need to do a line transient response, which is switching the input voltage very quickly between levels. And most bench supplies change their output very slowly. So that's a key factor we're going to have to work on. And also, we want to make an isolated output if possible and control it using a USB setup with Skippy commands, which are the standard text-based commands for uh, benchtop equipment. And we want to control the output voltage, the transient response time, and the current limit. And then we'll probably throw in an extra 5-volt supply in there for housekeeping of this circuit and other circuits in the system. So here's a list of the four main circuits that are going to be in this power supply. The first one is the PFC boost stage, so that's the power factor correction. And that might be a little overkill for this design. I think um, you can get away if you're just doing test equipment and it's under 200 watts or 100 watts or something like that. You don't really have to do power factor correction, but I think it'd be good to do it anyway. Uh, then the next will be the buck stage. So after we power factor correct it, it's going to be at a high voltage. And then we'll step that down with this buck stage to our range of 0 to 150 volts. And that's where we'll throw in the isolation. And then after that, we'll add a stage that will do the fast output transient response. And then also a section for the microcontroller that does the USB to the computer. So now let's dive into the power factor correction stage. We'll go into what is power factor correction and how we're going to do it and then look at some PWM chips we could select. So I found this nice handbook here, the On Semi PFC handbook. I'll put that in the description. Basically, if you're gonna rectify an AC signal to DC power, you're coming in here and you're going to use like an H bridge or it's drawn sometimes in the square kind of rectifier with four diodes. And the issue with that is that you're only conducting those diodes when your output voltage is lower than your input voltage because it has to flow from the input to the output. So ideally, if you're generating power with a rotating generator, you would want your voltage to be a nice clean sine wave and you'd want your current to follow it with a nice clean sine wave. And I guess you could think of uh, a mechanical and electrical reason for that. I mean, mechanically, if you have these weird spikes, you're going to be putting oscillations, uh, an oscillating load on your generator, which is going to cause vibrations and stuff. I think the momentum of the generator smooths all that out and it's probably not really a problem. The issue is more on the electrical side. You end up with all of these weird currents and 
Um, we don't have time to get deep into it right now, but you end up with oscillations between your load that's creating these high frequency pulses and the grid power lines between your house and the power plant and then all of the machines inside the power plant and all these oscillations go back and forth and they end up wasting a bunch of power that just gets dissipated in the generator or in the lines and not in your load. So it's kind of an inefficiency problem. Oddly enough, you aren't charged for it on your home meter, so it wouldn't necessarily save you any money to clean up these inefficiencies, but overall their standards are implemented because the grid becomes a lot less efficient if you have bad power factor. So what we do for the power factor correction is up here, instead of just having the rectifier and then a big capacitor, we add before our big capacitor a boost converter and we boost the voltage up to a voltage that's much higher than our input's peak voltage. And that way we can use the boost converter to pull current from the source in a sinusoidal fashion. So here's a drawing of how that works. You have this current pulse that the boost converter generates that tracks the input voltage and then that gets averaged out to be a sinusoidal wave that tracks the input voltage. So to figure out what we need to boost to, we need to figure out our maximum input voltage. So if we were just doing 120 volts, um, that's RMS, AC input. Multiply that by square root of two and you get around 170 volts peak. So you'd have to do over 170 volts for just 120. And then if we want to do that for 240, then it ends up being more like 340 volts. So the standard seems to be somewhere between like 380 and 400 volts for power factor correction for the first stage. Next, let's talk about different boost converter modes. So you can imagine here as this switch turns on in the boost converter, this current here ramps up through the inductor, creating the field that's gonna do the boosting. That's shorting down through here to ground. And then when you turn the switch off, all the field that's built up here forces the current to keep flowing through this diode to the output, boosting the voltage. So if you look at this, the three modes you can operate in are continuous current, discontinuous, and critical conduction mode. So continuous current is where there's always a lot of current throwing through this inductor. And you can see it would get higher and lower depending on if the switch was on or off, but it would never be zero. Discontinuous is when you just are doing little pulses through here. So you turn the switch on, you get a little current, you turn the switch off, it does a little pulse, and then it's zero for a while. Then you turn the switch on again. Critical conduction is where you have it right on the edge. So once the current goes to zero through here, then you turn the switch back on and you get it ramping up again. Then you turn the switch off, the current ramps down. As soon as it hits zero, then you turn the switch on again. So you're getting this critical kind of a thing. And you can see that this is going to be pretty dependent on the load because if you're not using the current that's flowing here, then your continuous conduction is going to drift down to critical and then it's going to go to discontinuous. So you can see where when you're picking a mode, uh, different controllers are built to run at different modes. So you kind of want to figure out what you need. So if you have a lot of power, you want to do a continuous conduction mode. And if you don't have much power, then you'd want to do maybe always keep it in discontinuous. And medium power, I guess, is critical. There are some advantages to a critical conduction mode. But what I was looking at, these numbers are pretty... I don't even know if these are really real for anything, the 250 watts, but it's something around there for just a rule of thumb. You could think if you have higher power, you want continuous, lower power, discontinuous. So for our case, we want 
really in the 5 to 50 watt kind of range is what we're actually going to be using. And we want this to be adjustable down to zero power. So it's definitely going to need to run in discontinuous mode. And I was thinking we should probably just design it to always run in discontinuous mode. That way it uh, doesn't have any problems. So for the PWM chip options, these are a few chips I was looking at. And uh, a couple by Infineon. I like uh, Infineon stuff. But I think we're going to go with this LT8312 because it runs always in discontinuous mode. So here's the data sheet for the 8312. It says up to 250 watts at 95% efficiency, so that's pretty awesome. It has a little drawing here of how you can set it up for a 200 watt boost converter. Universal input, so it says 90 volts to 265 volts, that's RMS AC. The output is 400 volts at half an amp. So on page 10 here they have an application note drawing of pretty much exactly what we want, 150 watt PFC boost converter. So what we're going to do is just copy this schematic into our own drawing program and make a PCB based on that. And then we'll probably do a bunch of this design just by trial and error so we can tweak the control loop and some of the filter stuff. And we'll be able to do that after we lay everything out because we'll just swap out different values for the resistors and capacitors. So I've been doing a lot of stuff in ORCAD, but I wanted to try Altium here, so I got this one. Not the full version, this is the Circuit Studio, which is like 500 bucks versus uh, 10 grand at this point or something like that. So I drew the circuit in here, which is basically the same from the data sheet. And you can see here is the AC coming in here, and then this little guy to suppress any spikes, and then the AC filter through the rectifier, and this is the main boost converter here with the 8312 chip. So the first thing the 8312 needs to do is sense the input voltage so that it can match the output current to the voltage sinusoidal waveform. And it does that actually after the rectifier here. So it comes up here and comes down through these resistors and into this VN sense pin right here. That's how it's measuring the input voltage. Next, we have overvoltage protection here with this resistor divider. After that, we have the DCM pin here, which is controlling the discontinuous conduction mode. And that's monitoring the current through the main inductor. It's doing that actually with a secondary winding on the main inductor here that is used exclusively for measuring that current. And it makes sure that it doesn't turn the switch on until after that current's passed, reached zero. Then here is the main feedback, the FB pin 9. You can see that's coming off the positive output through this resistor divider with three 1 meg resistors. There's three resistors here because it's a high voltage. So uh, you split the voltage between the resistors so you don't have to have a super high voltage resistor. And then it has a little bit of a filtering right here to clean it up a tiny bit. Low pass filter. Here we have the gate drive and you can see there's this 10 ohm resistor here that kind of helps limit the current of the gate drive so it's not stressing it out, just dumping uh, the power into the capacitance of the FET gate. But then they have this interesting thing here going back, which we could populate or not, depending, but it's this 0 ohm resistor with a diode, and I'm assuming that's just so that when you're trying to turn the FET off, you pull it down real fast. So the turning on this way is limiting the uh, supply current going to the FET, but when you're turning it off, it's got this path backwards to turn it off really quickly. 
And then down here we have this sense pen, which is measuring the current through the main FET using this 15 milliohm shunt resistor. Next, this VC is the compensation for the control loop. So that's these two capacitors and this resistor. That one is the one we're going to have to tweak to get the control loop Bode plots to look real nice and make sure everything's stable. And then this internal VCC is just a bypass capacitor, I'm pretty sure, to help the chip keep power for itself real stable. And then up here we have the output filter, so 100 microfarad capacitor. And then this here will go to the next stage, which will be the buck stage that'll step the voltage down to whatever level we set using the USB. So the next steps for this project are going to be to design the step down stage. For that, I'm thinking probably use some kind of a forward converter, an isolated converter, and then design the fast output stage. For that, I'm thinking either we'll do like a series linear regulator, like a post regulator, or some kind of a BJT power amp kind of a stage. And then we'll do the controller design. I'm thinking for that, we'll use like an ARM Infineon XMC kind of microcontroller, probably the 4100 series. Then we'll lay out a PCB that has a sort of a version of all these circuits on it, like a prototype PCB. We'll order the PCB, just a real cheap one. And then we'll write some Python scripts to try and communicate with it, and also the software to program the microcontroller. Then we'll build it and test it. So that's what to look forward to in future videos. Let me know what you think and um, what you prefer as far as project videos or tutorials on programs and stuff like that. And thanks for watching.